Good evening. It's time to begin our Wednesday evening worship. First song will be number 134. Wait. Nope, sorry. Wrong one. That's the second song. Uh, first song will be number 627. It's 627. The Glory Land Way. <clears throat> we'll sing the first and the last verses. Let's sing. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer, for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love, I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above, oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for. I'm in the glory land way. The song of invitation will be number 255. 255, I am resolved. And the song before the lesson will be number 134. 134. Faith is the victory. We'll sing the first and the last verses. Let's sing. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given, before the angels he shall know. His name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Evening. I don't usually do sports-themed things, I guess. I don't know why, but I just don't. But, but I came across this story... And, and, I, and I really liked it, and I thought it, it, it had a good, a good theme to it. You know, I came across the incredible story of Damien Chong Kui. Uh, never heard of him. I even asked my grandson, Parker. I figured if anybody had heard of this guy, Parker had. Well, he hadn't even heard of him. But anyway, um, he was a guard, or he is a guard. Well, he was a guard. He was a guard for the Mount St. Mary's basketball team that won the Northeast Conference Tournament in 2021 
which earned them a spot in the 2021 NCAA tournament. The odds of St. Mary's, Mount St. Mary, winning the NCAA tournament were so astronomical that the team was more likely to be hit by an asteroid in their team bus going to the arena to play. So their odds were, were really not very good, but they made it there. And, and part of it was because of this guy right here. But Chang, Chang Kui symbolizes the team's grit, determination, and uncanny ability to defy the odds. His story is both, both heartbreaking and inspiring. Born and raised in crime-riddled East Baltimore, his father and mother were both shot in separate, in, in separate incidents, less than two months apart in 2002. His, um, his father recovered, but his mother was murdered. Eight years later, his father was shot again and paralyzed from the waist down. Damien has been his father's most consistent caregiver since then, dressing him and helping him into his wheelchair. So you figure this, this young man was doing this all the, all the while while he's going to college and all the while while he's playing, playing uh, uh, basketball and, and all of that. So, so look at the odds that he, he had overcome. Um, Damien found an outlet in basketball starting on, on his high school basketball team as a freshman. When he started as a freshman, he was only four foot eight inches tall, which is not very tall for a, for a, a freshman basketball player in, in, uh, in high school. A growth spurt helped him reach his current height of five foot eight, which still isn't very tall. Uh, and when you when you look at the, the most of the basketball players now, no Division One teams showed interest, so he walked on with the with the Mountaineers. <clears throat> Not only did he go on to earn a scholarship, but he is a star, was a star in the heart and soul of his scrappy squad. Uh, now he's he's gone on since then. I, I did a little more research on him. He's gone on since then. Now he is playing in the Division One. I, I believe he's playing with uh, Purdue uh, for, in Fort Wayne. So he has gone on to a Division One school for his fifth year of eligibility. Um, from his father to coaches and teammates, Damien is called dependable, hardworking, and focused. Damien Chanqui has overcome tragedy to shine at Mount St. Mary's. There's no one who would want to go through what this young man has endured. Many might use such a tragedy as an excuse or a crutch to let life defeat them. But Chan Kui shows the resiliency and resolve which is, which is in mankind. While Chan Kui does not sound especially devout, Damien's father, Edward, said, to, said of him, I feel like God has been working things out for him. But God is able to bring about good in the worst of circumstances. It is evidence of, our omni, of, of his omnipotence and omniscience. Do you remember Job's wise and righteous assessment, even as he was in, dark, was in the dark about the cause and pain of his suffering? He tells God, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Uh, Job 42.2. As James assesses Job's situation, he writes, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Paul experienced this too. He speaks of his thorn in the flesh, which God saw fit to allow him to retain. Why, Paul? Why, Paul explains. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, which, in, which in, insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Maybe you are struggling with some things in, in, uh, with, with a thorn in the flesh, some pain and suffering, some adverse circumstance that looms over you and seems poised to undo you. How will you respond? Will you see it as an advantage, a chance for God's power to be perfected in weakness, for the power of Christ to dwell in you? As the means of strength and weakness, do you forget that there is no force, earthly or spiritual, 
that can withstand the advantages of God that God can bring into your life, even in times of greatest adversity. You know, we can overcome. We, we, if we trust in God, then we know that God, we, we see examples of it. We see Job. The examples of Job. Job was, look at what he went through. Yet God, God brought him through that. His purpose cannot be thwarted. And if our lives are being lived according to his purpose, Romans 2, 28, 8, 28, that, it, that is confidence that can propel us through the worst of situations. Remember, God did not remove uh, Paul's thorn. He didn't stop Job's suffering. And we see in Daniel 3.25 that he didn't remove Daniel or the lions from the den. He, he kept them there. Uh, and then we go on and we look at um, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. And God didn't remove them from that furnace, but he put, he put what, what some believed or what is an angel, which some believe is Gabriel or another angel, or some people even believe that it was Jesus himself, in that furnace with them. So you see, anything that, that we go through, God is there with us. He may not be removing the thorn in our flesh, he may not be removing the lions that are about us. He may not be removing the pain and the suffering that Job went through. But we know that God is with us. And we can see from these examples that he is with us. And we can see that if we trust in him and we obey him and we do as he says to do, that he will be with us and he will bring us through these adversities. And, and we are to use those adversities to build strength, to build us up to help us to be better Christians, to be stronger. God does things for a reason. I don't know what those reasons are. You know, I've lost a lot of friends over the last few years. Why God has allowed me to live and them to die, I have no idea. As a matter of fact, I got, a, I got an, an old friend that I've known for 50 years that's in the hospital now dying from cancer. Why is he dying and why am I living? I don't know. But one thing I do know is that God can work in me and through me to bring others to Christ. And he can do the same thing for you. He can work in you and through you to bring your, your pain and your suffering or whatever adversity that you're going through. He can use that to show strength um, in, 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 in our lives. He can use, use that to, to basically to shine, to shine God's providence on us. The Bible does not expand on, on who, it, who it was in there. But the point to, to be taken is that God is greater than any problem we are facing and will see us through it. God is bigger than any problem that we could possibly ever face. So just keep that in mind next time that you're having any issues or any problems or any, any struggles in life. If there's anyone here tonight that is, is struggling with any issues, that is struggling with any problems, what better time to come and, and ask for the prayers of your Christian family here at, at Lake Forest? You know, we are a Christian family. So what better time to, than to ask for that? You know, they, they say that the prayers of many uh, uh, avails much. So prayers, prayers, prayers of a righteous man avails much. So why not come now? If there's anyone here that hadn't been baptized, um, what better time than now? You know, because we're not promised the next day. We're not promised the next minute. I'm not promised that I couldn't walk, walk, walk over here and drop dead. You never know. You just never know. But one thing's for certain, if you're baptized into Christ and you're doing what God tells you to do, then you know that you are assured that you will go to paradise when you die. You're assured of that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. What Jesus say in Mark 16, 15, he that is baptized, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not my words, Jesus's. So is there anyone here tonight that needs anything from the church, any help or, or any, uh, uh, any prayers of the church? Come forward while we stand and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, 
Peace ever lured my side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. You may be seated. Good evening. Got some announcements for this evening. If you haven't already, please uh, ensure you pick up a bulletin before you leave. Um, the sick list is pretty lengthy. But, uh, there's more in the bulletin than what I'm going to announce here, so like I say, get a bulletin. But Tina Bradley's husband, Dwight, is improving and continues therapy at home. Um, keep Gloria Winston and her husband, Oliver, in your prayers as they take cancer treatments. Ralph Parsley fell and is recovering at home in West Virginia. John Martinez has been diagnosed with a hernia in his abdomen. Keep him and Mandy in your prayers. Please keep Star Collier's daughter, Skylar, in your prayers. She has COVID. Richard Harvey Sr. has prayers for his wife, who is in a nursing home and is in grave condition. Uh, my dad, who is requiring 24-7 care, not transitioning to a nursing home per se yet, we've agreed with him to give him two more weeks of therapy to see if he can make some improvement. Um, but just keep him in your prayers. Hopefully he gets to go home. If not, keep him in your prayers. Uh, Bobby Donorama is in need of prayer. She is at home. Ginger Swearsen's brother-in-law is recovering from cancer surgery. Please remember him. Sinette Ford asks for prayers for her son, Carrie, and is, uh, has COVID and is facing surgery. Um, when he covers from COVID for an appendix. They say he should be uh, having a surgery within the next six weeks. Um, him and the family live in Pensacola. And now, one of Carrie's children just got diagnosed with monkeypox. So, it ain't getting easier for that family. Please keep the family in your prayers. Susie Williams, three-month-old great-granddaughter, Badia, I hope I pronounced that right, is in the hospital in Mississippi. She's running a very high fever. And Brooke Johnson, Jay uh, Griffin's niece, will begin treatment, eventual surgery for her uh, tumor. So that's the, uh, the sick, but like I said, the sick list on the bulletin is much more, much lengthy, so please get that. Our sympathy is extended to uh, Melissa Blackman and her family and the death of her uncle who passed away July 12th. Services are scheduled for Friday in Abilene, Texas. Some good news. Congratulations to Bob and Melinda Morris. They are the proud grandparents of a baby boy, Jackson Lane, who was born July 11th, seven pounds and one ounce. The great-grandmothers, Miss Lynette Sizemore. So when you see her, congratulate her. I think it's her first great-grandchild, too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, note from the elders, uh, the door on the west side of the building will be locked on Wednesday evenings now. The uh, new worship schedule will begin September 4th. There's more details to come, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, mark your calendar for a men's breakfast at Dean, Dean Road Church. Uh, that's going to be September 30th. And July 31st, there's going to be a potluck fellowship after services. The elders will be speaking about the upcoming worship schedule after that fellowship that, fellowship that we have. And lastly, the uh, church directory, which is now available online, um, the information, how you get onto that, is on the bulletin. 
So get a bulletin again. <laughs> um, but that's all the announcement I have. Anybody have anything that we need to bring before the uh, congregation? All right, let's close out. Let's uh, do prayer before class. Our most holy, grace, Father, most holy is are you and greatest. We are so thankful, thankful to be here to learn more of your word. We just pray that things that are spoken to us tonight in all the classes and in this auditorium, and we can use it daily to enrich our lives to our benefit to uh, help the loving you and supporting you and getting your word out there. Dear Lord, we have so many on our sick list that's been brought up. There's more in the bulletin. We continue to pray that your hand be upon those taking care of those individuals. Please heal them if it is your will. Give comfort to the families. And Father, we're so blessed with our country that we have, the freedoms that we enjoy. There's so many bad things that have been going on, but we just pray that someday we'll get the leaders that we need with the elections coming up that will be more fearful of you and get back to your word as the guidance that we need. And Father, once again, we're just so thankful for many blessings you give us. Please be with us throughout the rest of this evening. We love you so very much, and thank you for your son, Jesus, for that great sacrifice. In his holy name we pray. Amen. We are using our summer series uh, this summer to talk about or to, or to kind of key in on our, uh, on our theme this year uh, to, uh, to think about the idea of growth. And we got, we got various topics we want to look at uh, as we consider the idea of growth. Last week we started out, we looked at the idea of, of growing as a student of God's Word, and we talked about some things with that. As I mentioned, the format that we want to kind of use with this, uh, we want to talk about whatever the subject is at hand. Uh, what the Bible says about it. We want to uh, look at some, maybe some common uh, mistakes that are made in this area, some common misconceptions about it, uh, and then look at, you know, really how we can grow uh, with this. And so we did that last week by looking at or talking about growing as a student of God. This week, we want to talk about um, growing as what we would call or maybe term uh, a benevolent giver. You know, the Bible talks about giving. And we're going to look at some verses here in just a moment where the Bible really keys in on this idea of giving. Um, you know, we sing a song sometimes uh, in our song service called uh, Make Me a Channel of Blessing. And the idea of the song is that, you know, God blesses us so that we can in turn bless other people. Uh, and that's what we want to do. Uh, but what I want to do as we begin, as we talk about this tonight, I want us to make sure that we don't, we don't sort of box ourselves in in two different ways. Number one, uh, I don't want us to box ourselves in with thinking this is only talking about money. Um, because there's a lot that we have to offer uh, to give uh, than just money. And not everybody needs money. There are things that people are going to need in this life that's not related to money at all. Um, so let's don't just think in terms of money. But number two, uh, let's don't just think in terms of um, our Sunday contribution. You know, uh, there's, there's other ways in which we give throughout our life 
And I think that what the Bible says, what it talks about, extends to all of those things and all of those ways uh, of what the Bible says. So tonight we're going to look at this idea um, of being a, a better giver, uh, a more generous, a more benevolent giver. Uh, when you go through the Bible, I think you will find that generosity is a, is a biblical idea. In fact, we as Christians, we're supposed to mirror who God is. And, you know, we were created in his image, and we are to mirror who God is to other people. When you think about God as a giver, when you look at your life and you look at your blessings and what all God, God has done for you, what kind of a giver would you call God? You wouldn't call him a stingy giver, would you? No, we, we, we would say God is generous, right? Um, and we should be a reflection of that. And as we talk about that, as, t this tonight, too, as, as you think about it, think if the, if the roles were reversed. What if God was a reflection of our giving? What if his giving was a reflection of our giving? And how generous would God be, right? So something to think about as we consider this. Um, but the Bible talks about it. And we're going to mention some verses tonight. I want to begin by looking at some things the Bible talks about in terms of giving. Um, you know, just as far as a starting point goes, we might think about Jesus and some of the words that he spoke. In Matthew 25, and we, we, we refer to this passage a lot, in the latter half of that chapter, Jesus talks about um, he's dividing the sheep from the goat, so to speak. Um, but those people who uh, were going to in, into heaven are the ones who Jesus said, you, you saw me hungry and you gave me, that's the word used there in that passage, probably just about in any version that you use, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. In fact, when you look through that, that particular uh, passage there, you see where um, there are needs that Jesus mentions that are met. He talks about being hungry, being thirsty, being a stranger, being naked, being sick, being in prison. And in all these ways, he talks about us, you and I as individuals doing this. We say maybe what the reaction was to uh, that Jesus sort of answered, Lord, when do we see you in, in these ways and, and help you or not help you? Jesus says that when you do it to somebody else, you're doing it to me. So anybody, you substitute anybody for Jesus. And that's what he's saying that we're doing there. So, um, and again, th this, I mean, think about it. These things really, uh, in and of themselves, how many of them actually would deal with money? Uh, you might argue that if someone's hungry or thirsty, you could give them some money to go buy themselves something, or you could give them something to eat, give them something to drink. Uh, the strangers being taken in, the naked are being clothed, the sick are being visited, those in prison are being visited. So not all of this deals with money. Uh, some of it deals with just investing your time in in someone else, doing something, other resources to be able to help uh, an individual out. But I think Jesus' words are important here as he talks about the idea of, of helping and even reflecting um, who we help in this world as a reflection of us helping Jesus. In Acts 20 and verse 35, Jesus is quoted there. Remember, uh, we have Jesus' words mentioned in the four Gospels. But then outside of the Gospels, we have this verse in Acts 20 and verse 35 where Jesus is quoted directly. And um, there it says, And everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So what is Jesus telling us? You know, in this life, you'll give, and in this life, you'll receive. We'll, we'll all be at points in time where we'll give, and we'll all have points in time where we receive. But Jesus says the greater blessing is in being one who gives. And so, you know, there's Jesus in, in using his words. Jesus noted not only the faith, but I think also the generous spirit of the widow who put, if you remember, put in two mites in the collection, which essentially was all that she had. And we see that in Luke chapter 21. Uh, here was a woman who, again, not only demonstrated great faith in what she did, but she demonstrated her generosity and that she took all that she had and she gave it. And Jesus compares that to the amounts of money that everybody else was giving out of their abundance, Jesus, if you remember, he said. Um, so he praises this woman uh, for what she does there. Uh, Solomon talked about the idea of giving. Back in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, uh, the first couple of verses there, he says, Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, 
We do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. And what Solomon's talking about here is he's talking about helping others. And when he talks about casting your bread on the waters, you'll find that after many days. In other words, what he's saying is that, that, that what you do will be returned to you, is in essence what he's saying there. So Solomon knew this principle as a king, as the wisest man to have ever lived, because God blessed him with that wisdom. And so he mentions that there. The Apostle Paul, he also mentions this uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28 when he talks about really changing from the old life to the new. He says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good. Now watch this. Why does he do that? So that he will have something to share with one who has need. So what he's saying there is he's saying, look, you... Don't steal, don't take from somebody else what is theirs, but rather work for your own. And when you do that, you should have enough for you and yours, but then also have a little bit more as well to be able to share with someone who has need. So, you know, when we talk about excess or having extra, what should we do with that? Well, at least in part, what Paul is saying here is that we should share with the one who has need. That's, that's the, you know, God blesses you. And so when God blesses you in this way, what should you do with that extra blessing? Well, God's given me enough to take care of myself and my family, but he's also given me more than just that. And so Jesus says here, use it to share with the one who has need. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible talks about the idea of, of giving. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, um, talking about uh, different uh, gifts and, and things that people can do. He says, one who exhorts in his exhortation, uh, he who gives, with liberality, okay? In other words, being generous in that. But then down in verse 13, he says this, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And so again, there, there are needs, and we are to contribute to that. But if, we are, if we're going to give, he says that we should give liberally or with liberality. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, Paul talks a lot about uh, wealth, uh, wealth and money and uh, you know, earlier in that, in chapter 6, he talks about, um, you know, money being the, uh, the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, but he goes on in verse 17, and he talks about instructing those who are wealthy. In other words, you know, he's not saying that if you have money that you have to automatically go and dump all of your money. But here's what he says to those people who have rich. He's, he talks about, verse 17, telling them not to trust in their money, um, but rather to trust in, in God. But then he says this in verse 18 about those individuals. He said, instruct them to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. In other words, you have something to share, have this attitude, be generous, be ready to share. We talked about the idea of, of our attitude or our mindset on, uh, on Sunday morning. This is one of those mindsets, those attitudes that we should have, that we should be generous, we should be ready to share. Uh, remember in Luke 12, Beginning verse 16, the story about the rich fool. We always talk about or call it sometimes the parable, the rich fool. Where there was this man who was greatly blessed, and he had all this stuff, right? And he says, and I've, I've really amassed a lot of things. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build greater so I can store up all my good, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back and I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to enjoy all this stuff that I have. And what did God say to him? You fool, yeah, your soul will be required of you this night. And he goes on to talk about the idea that this individual was not rich towards God. God had blessed him, but he was not using the things that God had blessed him with appropriately. That also kind of pivots, I think, towards the story of the rich man and Lazarus. When we look at the rich man and Lazarus, all that we know about the rich man, seemingly, why did he lose his soul? Okay, could the rich man have said, Lord, I didn't have an opportunity to do anything for anyone? <laughs> could he have said that? You know, like, like Jesus says in Matthew 25, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison or whatever? He couldn't say that, could he? I mean, Lazarus really, literally was set at his gates. He would have been aware of that. It's not like this man never left the house, okay? He was aware of Lazarus. He was aware of who he was, the problem that he had, the fact that he could not care for himself. And yet this man, and he, and he had it to give. It wasn't like this man lived in a little small house and he was barely eking by and, 
you know, he just didn't have enough to be able to give Lazarus anything. Lazarus was put there for a reason because people knew this man has plenty. And yet the Bible says that he, he can give me anything. And Lazarus, by the way, would have been content with what? Yeah. Hey, you didn't clean your plate, right? You ever, you know, maybe think about this guy being wealthy. Maybe he fixed himself a large meal and he, he's eating and he's like, oh, man, I'm full, I'm stuffed. I'm just going to get rid of the rest of this. Who could he have given that to? <laughs> Lazarus? Hey, Lazarus, you want what's left over on my plate? Well, guess what Lazarus would have said? No, no, no. Come on, man, give me my own plate. <laughs> you know? No, Lazarus would have been great. He would have been fine with that. He would have been perfectly content with that. He would have been happy with that. He didn't do that. The Bible tells us that he lost his soul. Now, I'm sure there were other things. In fact, that probably leads to or, or tells us about the kind of heart that this man had. But as far as what we know, and we see this man in torments, what we know about him is that here was an opportunity that was literally at his gate every day, and he did nothing, right? Um, but he had plenty. God had blessed him greatly. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16, um, the Bible says, And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's thought of as a sacrifice that comes before God. In fact, I think it's in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, uh, where Paul is writing about them helping the, the church in Jerusalem. Um, he talks about, um, maybe, maybe somewhere else I may be remembering, but anyway, he talks about um, gifts that were given. Actually, it's in Philippians chapter 4, I think, towards the end. Um, yeah, that's where it's at. Anyway, Paul talks about the work, the good that was done for him and how it was offered up as a sweet-smelling uh, sacrifice. Yeah, the, the sweet-smelling aroma of the sacrifice. So, in other words, that's something that's looked at as a sacrifice that comes before God, so to speak, when we do good and we share uh, with what God has given us and blessed us with. Um, so I think when we look at these verses, and by the way, there were a lot more. I mean, I, I didn't have time to put everything in there, obviously. But I do want to hit on some examples, some, some specific examples in the Bible of this. And there are lots, and again, we won't cover all of them. But just kind of some of the ones that I think stand out the most, I think the first one would obviously be uh, the early church. We think about the early church and, and, and what the Bible says about them. In Acts, the second chapter, in verses 44 and 45, uh, which is right after we see that, that, that sermon pre pe uh, preached by Peter, uh, there's about 3,000 that day are, that, are, that are saved. But notice what he says. And all those who had believed were together. Now watch this. And had all things in common. Okay? It doesn't mean when we say all things in common, like, oh, I got that shirt. <laughs> I, I, got that, I got that outfit, you know. I, I, I drive the same car as you. Um, what he means is that what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. Kind of the way we view marriage, right? I mean, when, you know. Um, that, that's literally how the church viewed what they had, all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now you think about, again, there's an attitude, right? Think about it. I think I said this in the sermon on Sunday. If you go through the Bible and you look for attitudes and mindsets, you will see it. it if you don't look for it, it's probably you're not going to see it. But if you look for it, it, it jumps off the page at you. Um, think about the, the attitude and the mindset that these people had. They didn't care. You know, they, well, this is mine. You know, this, this is mine. I'm not going to. They didn't care. They were, selling, they were selling their property. They were selling their possessions, right? Things that may have been dear to them in some way. And they were sharing them with anybody who had a need, right? They were freely doing all of this. They had all things in common. Uh, what a great example that is. And then over in Acts chapter 4, we see a little bit more to this regard says the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And there's a, a key to that. They were unified. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony. The uh, resurrection of the Lord Jesus, abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales. Lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Um, then, he, then he goes on to talk about Barnabas. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay? So the first century church had this attitude, had this mindset of, you know, look, I, I don't hold anything dear to me. Um, yeah, I have this property, but... 
I'm not using it. And if I can help somebody, sell it, take that money, help somebody who has a need, I'll gladly do that. Um, so this certain mindset, this attitude, but an example of, of where you see this idea of generosity. I mentioned 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Paul there, and we don't have time to read, obviously, all of that, but Paul there is urging these brethren in Corinth because there's a need. There's a need with the church in Jerusalem, and he's urging them to give towards that. Now, in part what he does is he looks at the church of Macedonia, and he says the Macedonians gave, and they didn't have anything. I mean, these, these, these were, by any, any term, by, by those terms, by our terms, they were poor people. They didn't have a whole lot, okay? Um, it, it'd be like going to the, maybe the poorest, you know, maybe to go to a, a, a real poor country somewhere where the people don't hardly have anything, you know, and yet those people pull together their resources and they give generously. And you see that example and you think, man, if they can do that, what could we do, you know? And so Paul uses that as an example. He brags on the Macedonians and their generosity, and he's saying to the church at Corinth, you need to, you need to be like them. He said, they come down here, they need to be able to see, because I've told them how you are. And he, he, you know, he basically was telling them, saying, look, I bragged on you to the Macedonians, but now I'm bragging about the Macedonians to you. But if the Macedonians come with me and they see you're not being very uh, giving or generous with what you've got, it might change their opinion of you, and we, we certainly don't want that. And so Paul was encouraging them to give uh, and to help others uh, who are part of the church. And so we see that example uh, in the New Testament uh, in that regard. So I think the Bible's clear. When we go through and we look at these verses, we see that you know, the Bible's clear about how God wants us to give. He wants us to be generous. He wants us to uh, be willing to give, not, again, not just of our money, but, but of other things as well. But as we think about this, let, let's pivot a little bit, and let's talk about some mistakes that we sometimes make uh, with, this, with this idea of giving. Um, what are some mistakes that we make? Well, I've got four main ones here that kind of came to mind as I was thinking about this lesson. Number one um, would be if we give with a bad attitude. I mean, again, we talked about the attitude these people had in the New Testament, right, in, in the book of Acts especially, um, that... They didn't look at anything as being there. Well, this is mine, and you can't, you know. They, their attitude was wonderful, but we also have to be careful of that because, you know, Paul even talks about that in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, I think it's in verse 7. He says that we should not give what? We hear it all the time when we talk about our contribution here on Sundays. We should not give what? Grudgingly or of necessity, right? We always say that. That's what Paul says. Don't, don't give with, with, with a, you know, this attitude that, well, I got to get, you know. Um, kind of a funny story. I want to say Greg Blackman told this story, but um, many of you remember John Perez was a member here for a long time. John passed away, it's been actually several years ago now. But uh, one of John's first services here at this church, he was, he was sitting in a pew much like this, and you know, they're passing the collection plate, and, and I think it was great. That, anyway, he, he gives it, and John says he's sitting right here on the end, and he, he hands him the collection plate, and John pulled out his wallet. Now, he's, he's not a member at this point. He's a visitor. Pulls out some money, puts it in, right? Kind of hands it back to, to Greg. Well, Greg kind of, you know, like passed it down the aisle. Well, when Greg does that, he thinks, oh. So he pulls out a little more money out of his wallet <laughs> and puts it in the plate. Greg's. So he says, so he pulls out some more. Greg says, no, I want you to pass the plate down. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, bless his heart. John had a good attitude about it. And if you know John, John was a good-natured person, and obviously he wanted to please God. Um, but if we're not careful, we can have a bad attitude about it. We can have a bad attitude about helping others, not just, not just giving on Sunday, but even helping others, you know, out here in the world. And if we're not careful, we can have... And, and, and honestly, and I think that's something that probably, if we're all honest, we all have pre maybe dealt with that a time or two. For example, you, you get off at uh, the interstate anywhere in Jacksonville, and as soon as you get to the end of the exit ramp, what do you see? Somebody with a sign, right, saying, you know, please help or whatever. You know, sometimes there's some specific stuff there. And we've all probably seen the, heard about stories on the news and things of some people running scams with this stuff. Some people will... I mean, I've seen videos of people doing that, and then they fall and they go get into like a Mercedes and they drive off or whatever, you know. Um, and, and there are people who do that who certainly will scam and, and things of that nature. 
But what that does for us as givers is it, it hardens our heart, doesn't it? We, we see that, and it upsets us. And then what happens is we see somebody, and maybe it's somebody who has legitimate need, but what happens to our heart or our attitude in that case? We, yeah, we're, we're turned off because of maybe a bad experience or we're, you know, well, I don't know, you know, these people, they, you know, we, we sort of lump them all in the same category and that kind of thing. So we have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to, to, to get a bad attitude, you know, towards, uh, towards helping others, towards being generous and, and giving and that sort of thing. And I'm not saying we just, we just hand out money left and right. You know, I'm not saying you walk down the street and just, you know, 20 for you and a 20 for you. Um, but, you know, we, we have to be careful that we don't develop a bad attitude because God doesn't want us to have a bad attitude when it comes to those types of things. Um, I think the second mistake that we sometimes make is we only, we only are willing to give of what we have left over. And that goes with money. It goes with time. It goes with other resources, you know. Sometimes we, well, if I'm, if I'm not busy at the end of the day, I'll reach out to so-and-so and I'll, I'll check on them or I'll see what they need, you know, or, or whatever the case is. Um, and we need to be careful that we're not only ever just giving, well, if I have something left over, I'll, I'll give it to you uh, or I'll help you uh, with what you need. Um, but that we're, you know, we're having the right attitude and that we're willing to give um, e even on a, even on a, a first basis, so to speak, um, with what we have. Uh, I think third is, is not giving in faith. Sometimes we don't give in good faith. We think to ourselves, well, you know, if I give this, then what about this or what about that or what about the rainy day or what if something happens? What if the washing machine goes out? What if the air conditioner stops working? Then what am I going to do? And, and we don't have faith. And, and again, we mentioned we brought up the widow and, and, and the two mites, right? There, there's your story of faith right there. I mean, here's a woman who literally, that's all she had. Now, I don't know that two mites would have fixed her air conditioning unit or would have bought her a meal. I don't know what it would have done. It probably wouldn't have done a whole lot. But you might have seen or, or, or understood the temptation she would have been faced with to say, well, you know, this is all I got, so I better hang on to it in case something happens. Maybe I can talk somebody into two mites for whatever I need. But she gave it. And she gave it because she had her faith in God. And, and so... Um, I would say a mistake that we can make with our giving is if we don't give in faith, that God will take care of us. I'm not saying God's going to make you rich. That's not what I'm saying, right? I'm not, I'm not turning into Joel Osteen up here. Um, we're not talking prosperity gospel or that kind of thing, right? Um, but that God will make sure that you are taken care of. And we see that from scriptures, Matthew chapter 6. He talks about that when he points to the lilies of the field and the birds of the air as an example of that. If God takes care of them, are you not more important than they? Yes. Okay, then if God takes care of them, will he not also take care of you? Yeah, but, you know, this is my last $10 bill. Uh, you know, so that's kind of the, you know, if we're not careful, then we find ourselves not giving in faith. Um, and then number four, giving out of selfish motives. That's what Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about, and, and specifically there in Matthew chapter 6, he's specifically talking about, um, giving to others. Your, uh, some versions call it your charitable deed. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets so that they may be honored by men. So, you know, he's talking there in the first four verses about your motives in what you do. We need to be careful that when we give, that we're not giving out of selfish motives. Um, Ananias and Sapphira gave out of selfish motives. They, they, wanted, they wanted to be patted on the back. They saw what Barnabas had done, right? I mean, chapter 4, we just read it. It leads right into chapter 5, what talks about them. They'd seen others who had done the same thing. And they were willing to do that, but they wanted to keep back. But they wanted it to look like they had given all because, oh, man, you know. They probably heard people say, oh, did you hear that Barnabas sold a whole track of land, gave it the money to the apostles, you know. And they probably wanted people to say about that about them, you know. Oh, here comes that Ananias and Sapphira. Boy, those are some generous people right there, I tell you, you know. Um, they had selfish motives. Their motive wasn't helping. It was to be, you know, hey, everybody else is doing it. We might want to do this too, but let's make sure we look good when we do it. So let's just say we, we're given all of it, but let's keep some for ourselves, okay? Um, and, and the apostles even told them, look, it was yours, you know? 
Nobody would have faulted you if you would have kept some of it back. Nobody would have faulted you. But you made it appear as though you'd given everything because you were worried about how it looked. So, again, their motives weren't, weren't right. And they lied, obviously. And uh, so, in so doing, um, they, actually, they, they paid the penalty, right? Um, and so, uh, we read about there in Acts, the fifth chapter. And so, those are some mistakes that if we're not careful, we can make um, with this idea of giving. But here's some misconceptions about giving, okay? Uh, some things that maybe people think in their minds or have said um, that, are, that are not true but can keep someone from giving as they should. Uh, number one is we, we have to be wealthy to be able to give to other people. I'm no, I'm no millionaire, you know. Um, because we hear about philanthropists, right? We hear about these people that have all this money. And, you know, boy, if I had that kind of money, I guess I'd, I'd be required to give away too. Um, but, you know, thinking that you have to be wealthy to give is, is not true. Really, when you think about it, wealth is relative, is it not? I mean, I can, I can tell you right now as I stand before you, I am not a wealthy man. But if you were to, if I were to go to, and I, my wife and I, uh, the year we got married, we took a, a group of kids down to Nicaragua on a mission trip. If I were to go to Nicaragua, and put myself amongst the people there, guess what I would be there? I'd be rich. I'd be rich. Because those people there, uh, most of them do not own a car, a single car. And I have three, okay? Three drivers, right? But most of them, their houses, um, they're open. They, their doors, they don't have a door on their front door. They're, they don't have windows on there. Um, they might have one television set uh, for the house. Um, you know, probably don't have air conditioning, many of them. Uh, you know, just... If I were to compare myself to them, yes, I am super rich. I am so wealthy. Um, so it's a relative thing, right? It's, it's relative. Um, but for us to think, well, you know, if I'm not a millionaire, then I can't really give. Like, no, that, that's not true. We can still give. We can still help. It may not be as much as the millionaire can do. The widow gave two mites. She didn't give as much as other people money-wise, but percentage-wise she did, right? But... Money-wise. But she didn't think to herself, well, I'm not wealthy, so I might as well not go in there and throw in my little two little mites, you know. <laughs> yeah, you better. All right. Uh, <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. All right. Uh, by the way, the lottery, if you don't, the lottery is a tax on poor people, if you don't know that. Because that's generally who buys it, because they're looking to get rich quick, and it, all it is is ends up taxing them, right? Uh, okay, number number two, um, I don't have anything to offer. And this kind of goes with, maybe with number one. I don't, I don't have anything to offer. You know, look at your life and look at how God has blessed you. It doesn't just have to be about money. There may be other things that you have to give, right? Other resources and things of that nature. Um, can you offer encouragement to someone? Does that cost you anything? Not a dime, right? Okay. So, again, you know, thinking that we don't have anything to offer. Number three, thinking that people don't deserve our help. In other words, well, that person's probably not a good person, so they don't really deserve my help. Again, if God was a giver like me, what kind of giver would he be? I know that rhymes. I didn't mean to. But think about it. Would I, do I deserve God's blessings? No. But does God give to me anyway? Sure. Okay. Now, again, I'm not saying just go around handing out money. doesn't matter right? But, you know, thinking that people don't deserve our help is a misconception. Number four, and this kind of ties in with it, we can only give after we vetted a person thoroughly, <laughs> you know? Uh, could you fill out this form, sir, uh, while I'm sitting here at this red light? And uh, depending on where you are, you may have plenty of time. Um, and I'll, I'll see if you meet the qualifications for my help. Um, you know, there are times where, yes, you may have a conversation with someone. You may find out something about them. But there are times where you just have to make a decision, you know? This person looks obviously like they need help. Am I willing to give them a little something to help them out, whether it's food or drink or whatever the case may be? Um, number five, that, that, that God doesn't really care about what we give or anything of that nature. Or maybe he only cares about Sunday. And Other than that, God doesn't care. Well, that's not true either. Again, the Bible talks about generosity. In fact, the proof that God cares, again, go back to the, uh, to the, to the rich man of Lazarus, okay? That man lost his soul, and apparently God cared <laughs> that what, you know, about what he did. Um, and then number six, um, if I give $10, I'll get a check next week for 20 
Okay. Now, again, God blesses us, right? And, and Solomon talks about this. It's talked about in other places, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. But let's don't think that God is specifically working in this way where, well, if I give this guy $10, then I'll get, to, you know, because at that point, we're, we're, our motives are starting to, to get bad, right? We're, we're starting to think about maybe what we can get out of it and not what we're doing to help others. Um, so be careful. Now, again, God will take care of us, but it doesn't mean that he's necessarily just going to shoot you a check for 20 the next week and uh, take care of you in that way. Um, just a few minutes left, so let's hit. There's nine things I want to mention to you tonight, and this is how we can grow. This is how we can become better at being generous, at being givers, at helping others. Uh, number one, we need to make sure that we love and value people. Uh, first greatest commandment is love God with everything you got. That's number one. Got to do that. But then number two is right behind it, and that is you love your neighbor as yourself. When I see other people, do I, what, what do I think when I look at them? You know, do, I, do my thoughts automatically turn negative towards them because they're in a predicament, you know? Well, I guess they messed up their life. Well, that's their fault, you know? Um, we don't know why people are in the predicament they're in. It may be that many of them are in that predicament right through their own faults, um, but we've all made mistakes, right? Maybe some have experienced hardships in life, um, you know, and, 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 and that may be the case as well. But it starts with loving and valuing people. If we don't love people, we're not going to help them. We're not going to be. We're not going to do it. We don't love them. So we have to start by loving and valuing people. Number two, have faith. We already mentioned this about not having faith, but have faith. In other words, let God be true. You remember what God told the Israelites in Malachi? He says, try me, test me. He says, you, you give, because he got on them, because they were, what were they doing? They were giving God the lame, right? In other words, you go to sacrifice, and they'd go find, well, this sheep's got a broke leg, and it's about to die anyway, so let's just give this one and sacrifice it to God. That's what they were doing. And God said, you, you test me, you try me. He says, you give and you watch what I do. I'll turn around and I'll give to you blessings like you've never seen. I'll pour them out from heaven, right? Let's, 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 let's let God be true. Let's have faith when we do that, that God will take care of us. Number three, um, understand what you have to offer. Look at your life and say, what is it that I have to offer? Maybe it is money. Maybe it's food. Maybe you're a good cook. Maybe, you know, you, you, know, you, maybe you cook meals and you always have leftovers and you think, well, these leftovers always go to waste. Could, could, could you give them to somebody who maybe needs it, you know? Um, maybe, it's a, maybe it's an ear. Maybe you've got a good ear. There are times when people just need, to, just need to talk. They just need somebody to listen to them. They don't need advice. They don't need somebody saying, oh, let me tell you how to solve all your problems. They just need to talk. They just need somebody to listen to them. And that's free, right? doesn't cost anything. Uh, you know, maybe it's a shoulder to cry on. You name it. Right? There's all kinds of people. I mentioned this at the beginning of the lesson. Not everybody needs money. Okay? Uh, there are people that need things that maybe you can offer these things to them. Um, and that goes back to valuing people and loving them to seeing what they have, what, what they need. Understand what you have to offer them. And then number four, we need to see the blessing in giving. Again, we've talked about Malachi 3, Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given to you. In fact, God says, I'll, I'll give to you more than you can imagine. Acts 20 and 35 is more blessed to give than to receive. We need to understand that there is blessing in giving. Yes, there is, it, we're, we're blessed when people give to us. We, we, we recognize that. But there is a great blessing in being able to give to someone and help someone out. And I think we've probably all experienced that before as well. Number five, maintain a good attitude about giving. We talked about that already. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9-7, uh, being cheerful in your giving. Not grudgingly, not of necessity. Um, number six, see the heavenly reward instead of the earthly loss, right? What do we think about? Well, if I give this to this guy over here, I'm not going to have this anymore. So we concentrate on the earthly loss versus looking at the heavenly reward that we gain from that. Number seven, be willing to sacrifice. There will be times where to be a generous giver, you will have to sacrifice in some way. Be willing to do that. Number eight, if you are going to err in giving, err on the side of being generous and not being stingy, okay? And then number nine, remember what you have is not yours. And I sense Sapphira, anybody, right? It's really not mine. It's God's. And what would God want me to do with, with what I have? And so certainly he wants me to be a good steward of what I have. But at the same time, God wants me to be able to take what he's blessed me with and to be able to help others in, in some way in giving as well. Uh, so just, just some ways tonight as we think about being benevolent givers, being generous, as the Bible talks about, uh, some things we can do to improve that and to grow and to be better in that area as well. Let's close out with a prayer.
Our God and Father, we're thankful to you for all that you do for us, Father. It's for all your many blessings. Father, we know that you bless us so greatly, Father. And you bless us in so many ways, more than we could ever repay to you or anyone else. Father, we just pray that you would help us to have the attitude to, to, to help others as they have need, Father. To be able to give to others who have some kind of a need, uh, Father. To help us to, to look for those needs and to be generous as we do that, Father. Uh, being a reflection of who you are in your generosity to us. Father, be with us and bless us as we leave here tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.